Hello and welcome back to the Sunday special episode of the U Up podcast. I'm Jordana Abraham. And I am Jared Freed. Uh, we are super excited to have a very special guest. They are a sex educator and researcher, author of Come As You Are, The Surprising New Science That Will Transform Your Sex Life and Burn Out the Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. Emily Nagoski, thank you for coming on. Hello, thank you so much for having me. How are you? Of course. I am pandemic amazing. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> Given the current circumstances, I'm doing really great. Where are you coming from? I am in Western Massachusetts. How about you? Oh, uh, the Berkshires. Almost, yeah. Okay, cool. I'm from outside of Boston originally, so a little bit yeah. familiar with the area. But I'm in Boca, yeah. Florida, and Jordana's in New York. Yes. Um, and I'm so excited that you're coming on the show. I've had so many people DM us about your book. Um, I know you also have a podcast that's also called Come As You Are. Great title, by the way, Thanks. I have to say. I had to fight for um, it, actually. Really? Yeah. I think it's perfect. And even like the front of your book also with like just the art. Yeah. It's just very, I uh, yeah. thought it was very well done, very tasteful, and yet very interesting. Um and, you know, I think that this that your research is so interesting because I think we all assume that like that everyone's sex drive is like sort of the same or that if we're, you know, if, if, I, if we're with a partner and they have a lower sex drive that it's personal, I'm sure everyone has has encountered some of that. And it's so interesting what you've done because you've really looked into the research of like, I remember like one of the really specific things in your book about how there's like some there's usually someone who's like more proactive sexually and the other person who kind of has to be I don't have to use I'm not definitely not using the right terminology but like there's the other person who sort of needs needs is like a reactive right so we're talking about desire style and mm -hmm. to be totally clear like everybody experiences both of the major kinds of desire, well, not everybody, a whole lot of people. Some people are primarily spontaneous desire. Some people are gonna be primarily responsive and most of us are gonna be both at the same time. Spontaneous desire is the kind of desire that when I was growing up, I was taught as the normal kind of desire and what I think most people hear. Spontaneous desire is when you're just like eating lunch or your mind is just wandering and you're just out of the blue spontaneous and like oh, I, would, I would like to get to the sexy times i wonder if there's anyone to be interested in the sexy times with me and maybe you go home to your partner and you're like how about some sexy times today that's spontaneous desire <laughs> and it's one of the that's how i say it all the time desire. I come home and I... How about the I, sexy I, time? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And I, I think that's always been sort of like something that's been, been more stereotypically said about men. Yes, it was too. more stereotypically right, yep. taught about men. And alas, the nature of medical research is to assume that women are like men, except a little bit broken. <laughs> and so women's sexual desire was assumed to be spontaneous just like it is for sort of like the standard experience of men uh but then in the late 90s a sex therapist in canada named rosemary basson developed this idea of responsive desire so instead of just spontaneously out of the blue wanting sex you're a person who like maybe you schedule date night for example it's something a lot of therapists recommend and you know as you get ready for it, you're sort of like, I got to put the last of the dishes in the dishwasher. I'm going to bring up the last load of laundry with me. And you take off your clothes, you show up, you put your body in the bed, you let your skin touch your partner's skin, and your brain goes, oh, right, I like this, and I like this person. That's responsive desire. And it's actually how couples in long-term relationships are most likely to experience desire if they successfully sustain a strong sexual connection over multiple years. So where spontaneous desire emerges in anticipation of pleasure, responsive desire emerges right. in response to pleasure. And they are both normal, but which one gets actually treated as normal in our culture? Like just the one, right? So if you've got a couple right. where one person is mostly spontaneous these days and the other one is mostly responsive these days, you've got a couple where like the responsive desire partner is considered like the patient. They're the one with a problem that needs to get 
fixed. Yeah. And that's not even a little bit what's happening here. When a person has responsive desire, the solution is not to fix it. There's nothing wrong. You are normal and healthy. The solution is to create a context that makes it easy for that person to experience pleasure because pleasure opens the door to the desire. Hmm. So it sounds like the the um, the one that's not spontaneous is really what they it it's, it sounds like it's it, it kind of uh, conjures when you when you say that like relationships are work. It's like because in the beginning, I think that in the beginning of any relationship, I think the thought is like it's always spontaneous or you're always like on or you're very lustful of the person you're with. And yeah. then it can seem like someone loses interest. But really, it's just maybe change, like you said, changing from that. Changing the context. Right. right. So in the beginning of a relationship, um, the context is such that it's easy to get to arousal, desire and pleasure. You're, you know, making a special dinner for your certain special someone and you're slicing things in the kitchen and they come over and they start kissing you and somewhere special and your knees melt and you're like, let dinner burn because it's just like that. Your arousal and pleasure desire are there. 10 years down the line, maybe a couple of kids, you're in the same kitchen cooking the same special meal. Your partner comes over and kisses you in the same certain spot. And instead of your knees melting, you're like, could you please just go set the table? <laughs> There's nothing wrong. All that has happened is that the context has changed. And sure, sometimes for some people in the hot and heavy fallen in love stage, Desire feels like it is seconds away all the time, but just because it's not seconds away all the time doesn't mean there's a problem. It just means the context changed. I, how do you figure out, you know, is there like, are there hacks to this, to figuring out where you are on the desire spectrum? You know, where you are, like, you know, how do you figure out where your partner is? Like when, you know, how do you figure out is this, kiss on the neck time or is it you know set the table time is there ways to like figure these things out or is it a guessing game it's never a guessing game <laughs> uh and i mean like the number one answer is the easy thing to say and the difficult thing to do and that is you know ask your partner right and there's all kinds of reasons why people find it really difficult sometimes to ask their partner, not least because they're afraid of making their partner feel pressured and not least because they're afraid of experiencing a form of rejection where they're like, how are you? How are you feeling tonight on the and your partner's like, no, that's not an experience people find to be really positive. Sorry about what I did to the microphone just there. No, it's okay. <laughs> Most people uh, have, a over time you develop a sense of where your partner is and remember people change over time, even from day to day. So the main thing, okay, here's my radical wild idea. I would like all of us to forget about desire. We live in a culture that has taught us to put desire at the center of our definition of sexual well-being, right? which is bananas. Why would we measure our sexual well-being in terms of how dissatisfied we are with the amount of sex we're having right now? Which is ultimately, it's like, I would like something that, I'm, that I don't have right now. I want something. It's like super just like capitalist, boring, don't create space to enjoy what you have, just keep pursuing something new and different. Forget about desire. Instead, put pleasure at the center of your definition of sexual well-being. And when you do that, all the other pieces fall into place. So instead of trying to gauge what your partner wants right now, try to gauge what they like right now. Do they like you setting the table or do they like being kissed on the neck? One might easily be uh, something that changes the context so much that they like the other thing now too. When you think about pleasure, like what is the context that makes it easy for my partner to have access to pleasure of any kind? When you center pleasure, all the other pieces fall into place. Only ever do things you like. Absolutely. I, I, I guess I, I guess the my question is because this is like new language for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, the difference between, you know, we these have been ingrained in us, you know, so just like you said and i i agree the idea of desire versus pleasure like is there 
ways to talk about this with a partner that you've been with a long time. Like some people, you know, they the, the shirts button up like they got to unbutton a shirt, you know, to figure this out. You know, what is kind of your best, you know, strategies to get it, to get to those answers? Oh, there's a lot of levels of answer to that question. The okay. first one might be in actually understanding how sexual res arousal and response works in the first place, which is this thing called the dual control mechanism. It's called the dual control mechanism because it's got how many parts? Two. 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 And if I tell you the first one is the sexual accelerator or the gas pedal, that means the other one is going to be... The brakes. The brake. And the brake is where the magic happens. So the accelerator in your brain just notices all the sex related information that it experiences and it sends a turn on signal, right? And that results in the sort of like turn on experience that many of us are familiar with. But at the same time and in parallel, your brakes are noticing all the good reasons not to be turned on right now. Everything from every sense, everything you see, hear, smell, touch, taste everything you think believe or imagine and all the sensations inside your body and emotions and it assesses the potential threats and when it notices that stuff it turns on the brakes and it turns out when people are struggling with any domain of sexuality from pleasure desire arousal orgasm it's sometimes it's because there's not enough stimulation to the accelerator but most of the time it's because there's too much stimulation to the brakes. So all the standard sex advice about handcuffs and role play and porn and sex toys, those are all great. If you like them, go for it. And mostly what people actually need is to figure out what's hitting their brakes and if there's anything they can do to get rid of that stuff. Stress, obviously, is going to be number one for a whole lot of people cultural shame baggage is going to be a big factor for a lot of people trauma history is going to be a big factor relationship distress obviously is going to hit the brakes as a potential threat so figuring out if you want to like think about yourself and your partner you think about what activates your accelerator what kind of stuff hits your brakes and what you can do to get rid of that stuff that's hitting the brakes to make it easy for the accelerator to do its thing yeah, I love I love the idea of the breaks because it that's genuinely that's when we start to get like, you know, in our own heads, I think. And especially with emails that we get, we go, I'm doing all the accelerators. It must be me. I must be pushing the gas wrong. But it really, you know, there's this whole other side of it that you're talking there's about. There's a whole other side. <laughs> right. That, that's, and it's a big side of it that is it relates to our whole lives and how we live, which I think yeah. people have to take into account. Almost all the things that hit the accelerator have nothing to do with sex itself. So, like, for instance, I feel like we get this question a lot of someone writing in and they're like, I want sex a lot more than my partner. And that's our mm -hmm. fundamental. That's our fundamental issue is like the, either, you know, I want it less or I want it more. It's uneven what they would call like a, se a sex drives. And I think that's very frequent like what's the is that i'm sure you hear that a lot oh yeah that's called the technical term is a desire differential and it is the single most common reason why couples of all relationship structures and all gender combinations seek sex therapy is because one partner wants sex way more than the other partner does uh, i have a friend and colleague a sex therapist and researcher named peggy kleinplatz and she tells Great the story name. of Right? It's and like a, I, I feel like it's out of like a Nickelodeon cartoon. I love it. I would love to be, for there to be a cartoon adaptation of Peggy Kleinplatz's office of like what <laughs> happens in her therapy sessions. I think it'd be amazing. Sure she would great. look great as a cartoon. Oh, well, you have to be on Adult Swim. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. So the example story she tells is a couple comes in and one partner says, actually, I'd be fine if we never had sex again. I'm sorry that hurts my partner's feelings, but that's just how I feel. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. It's a, That's the worst case scenario here. Uh, and Peggy's response is, so tell me about this sex you don't want. Okay. What kind of think, sex do you think they describe? Like, un non-passionate, like... 
formula mechanical sex. Total, yeah, lacking in pleasure. Yes, not da- dismal and disappointing. If you don't want sex, chances are the sex that's available to you is not sex that gives you any particular reason to want sex. What Peggy says is sometimes low desire is evidence of good judgment. And so her next question is, okay, so I rather like sex, but if I were having that sex, I wouldn't want it either. So what kind of sex is worth wanting? It's an interesting change of the question. I mean, like, I guess you don't think of it that way. I mean, the pleasurable one, right? But Yeah. And this but is maybe, what I mean by, like, put pleasure at the center of sexual right. well-being. Forget desire. If you don't like – I mean, I literally – I was having drinks with a couple of friends, and I said the thing I say when, when they have had two small kids, and they were struggling with desire, they told me. And they were like, so, Emily, just real casual, um, how do couples uh, sustain their sexual connection when they've got two young kids? And I was like, well, you – Accept responsive desire. You put, you set a time, you put your bodies in the bed, you let your skin touch your partner's skin, and you remember, oh, right, I really like this, and I really like this person. And as I was saying that, you let your skin touch your partner's skin, one of the partners was literally going, uh, leaning <laughs> away from the table. And I was like, okay, so, so there's your problem. It is not that you do not want the sex. It is that you do not like the sex that is available to you. You don't have a desire problem. You have a pleasure problem. So, so I. I so, what's the I, solution I, for that couple? Figure out what kind of sex is worth wanting or even having. So, this mm-hmm. is uh, another point to jump onto that. I guess what you know, a lot of times, what happens in these relationships, it's two people, and I would assume it's the breaks side of things, Heck the yes. fears, the traumas, the. The, all that other stuff that they're dealing yeah. with on the break side. The past makes... 10 years she had spent trying to explain what she likes, for example, from Cunnilingus <laughs> and him not listening or doing it. Right. Um, but I would I would assume, you know, what happens a lot is let's do something new. And the couple looks at right. each other and goes, what do you want to do? And then the other person goes, what do you want to do? And then they, they're back at where they began, which is the sex they both cringe at. How do you open up that conversation to get creative with someone? And I, I and I would assume a lot of that is like getting past the trust issues you have and and and, yes. and things of that that nature. But do you, how do you go to that next level of let's get? I like you. Yeah. I don't like the sex we're having. We want to get creative. How you yeah. know? Don't get creative. Don't. Okay, yeah. I like this. Forget creative. That's not. Right what's going to get you where you want to go. What we can learn from the couples who do sustain strong sexual connections over multiple decades is they have a few things in common. First of all, they are really good friends. They like each other. They trust each other. They admire each other. If that foundation isn't there, why are you having sex with someone you don't like, trust, and or admire? So the structure of the relationship itself is foundational. Okay. Were you going to say something? No, I, 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 the friends thing I think is so, it's funny the way you present that is like, uh, you know, some couples are looking going, oh my God, I'm not even friends with this person. They're, they're probably having that realization right now. <laughs> yeah. I and don't even like They you. may actually be having perfectly fine <laughs> sex, actually. Right. And be like, I don't need to be friends with my partner in order to have good sex. And that is fine. Everyone's context is different. Uh-huh. But if you're not friends with your partner and you're not having good sex, it is very unlikely you'll be able to find a way to have good sex with that person if you don't like, admire, and trust them. So, friendship. Characteristic number two is they prioritize sex. They decide that for some reason it really matters for their relationship that they stop doing all the other things they could be doing, right? They maybe have kids to raise. They maybe have jobs to go to. They have other friends and family to pay attention to. God forbid they just want to watch a little TV and go to sleep, right? Okay. We are busy. There are so many other things we could be doing with our time. Why would people stop doing all that important stuff just to do this, I mean, let's face it, pretty silly thing we humans do of like rubbing our genitals against each other and licking each other's skin and putting our tongues in each other's mouths and around each other's genitals. Like, why? Why would we do that? Um, and when I ask people this question, the most common answer is connection. 
because right. it's a really powerful way for a lot of people, not for everyone, but for a lot of people, sex is a really powerful way to reinforce the sense of connection with this person. It is, in fact, a form of play. Play is the foundational behavior of friendship, where there's no stakes, you are just doing things because you both enjoy it, and it's right. fun, right? Yeah. So that's number two, is you prioritize sex because it matters for your relationship. And that's, there are times in a relationship when it does not matter. When it just drops away, the early part of bringing a child into your home is like the classic example of like, if sex goes away, that makes sense. Because you have a whole bunch of other stressors that are taking up all the space. Yeah. Yeah, and even no if time it's not play. a biological bringing a child into your home, if yeah. you adopt a kid yeah. of any age, your life yeah. is going to be transformed and your understanding of yourself as a human and of your relationship is going to be utterly transformed. Mm -hmm. And gradually, the nature of your sexual connection will be integrated into that co total transformation. But it probably won't be the first thing that you're thinking about. Is like, how does this total revolution in my identity and our relationship what does that mean for our sexual connection that's not first right feeding this new human in your house mm. that comes first am i doing this right am, am i why did they let me be responsible for someone else's life what <laughs> so, so there are times when it sex drops off the priority list and that is also normal the couples who sustain a strong sexual connection over the long term uh are not the ones who never have sex disappear in their relationship. They're the ones who find their way back to each other after okay. whatever has happened. Third characteristic, and maybe the most controversial, the couples who sustain this strong sexual connection, whatever their relationship structure, whatever their gender combination, are people who are actively and continually dismantling mantling the gender binary and the cultural scripts they were force-fed when they were children, long before they were ever able to consider whether or not they wanted to believe these things about sex. Like if you're born into a body that make all the adults around you go, it's a girl. From that day forward, you are taught that you have a moral obligation to be pretty, happy, yet calm generous and unfailingly attentive to the needs of others and if you fall short in any moment of being all of those things then you deserve to be punished because this is your moral obligation and when you put that narrative into a sexual context that you have a moral obligation to be attractive to this person and to make sure all they're satisfied their needs are being met their expectations are being met then you end up doing things like faking orgasm and if you're born into a body where everybody goes, it's a boy, then you're taught that the only emotions you have permission to access are anger, winning, and horny. And if you're trying to get any I got, of- I'm, I, I, I sell that t-shirt on my website. <laughs> <laughs> Angry, horny, and winning? Angry, horny, and winning, baby. <laughs> So suppose a person who's given that script, who is literally punished as a child, right. if they dare expect the, express these other emotions, like God forbid they're sad or lonely, if they have a need related to these really uncomfortable feelings, then it's going to express itself as anger or horniness. And so they go to their partner with a desire for sex that's really just a mask for, I feel isolated and I'm longing for connection. And then if their partner declines, they're not just declining sex, they're declining this whole like emotional bid for connection. Mm -hmm. Worse even than that, the It's a Boy script is so, so, can I swear? Please. It is so fucked up and is ruining the world. Because the It's a Boy script says that, like, if you're born into this body, it means that you already know everything about sex, never experience curiosity, never ask any questions, never be open to feedback. And also, we can measure your worth as a human on Earth by your success rate at getting somebody else to have sex with you. So when your partner turns you down for sex, they're not just turning down sex, they're not just turning down your bid for connection and intimacy, they are invalidating your whole identity. 
So it feels right. so high stakes when you dare take that like vulnerable step of trying to initiate sex with someone else because it's like your whole identity is on the st- is on the right. table. And that probably leads to all those like dangerous sexual situations. That is that is literally what leads to those dangerous situations. It's what leads to incels. It's what leads people to take a gun into a nightclub or a school or a mall. Right. I I was just speaking to someone privately, but they messaged me about being not uh, they weren't they weren't uh, experienced in sex. And they're yeah. like, kind of like, and they're in their first thought. This was a nice person. I'm, the, you know, I, I know there are horrific things that happened, and I, I, I hear you on that. I, but this is kind of more in the everyday guy that I'm yeah. talking to. He's going, well, I'm just gonna go through with it. And I was like, I, I said, I go, that's a bad strat. I go, why not go just say, what? like, just like I'm just gonna fake it till I make it. That, that it was kind of his the strategy that I heard. And I'm like, and I, and I said to him, I go, this plays against, you want to do well. Like you want to make this person feel good, whoever you may be with. They didn't even have someone in mind. They were just saying it has gone bad in the past. And you know, their thought is, well, I'll just fake the way I heard it. And this wasn't how they said it, but it was fake it till I make it as far as I'll go through sex and get better on the fly. And I was like, and I said to him, I was like, why there are so I, many other better options right the bet i and i said to him i go i go you don't understand what expectation you know and you know how setting expectation can make you look even better and it's like but it is that male thing of like and i use fake it till it make it it wasn't their words it's my words because it is a very um it's a very male and something that I can identify with. Like I understand. Yeah, like I'm going to pretend I already know what I'm doing. Uh, right. I'm probably going to fuck up, but I'm just going to like barrel through. And, and from their perspective, they were like, well, I, I I, they were like, they were from their perspective. They were like, it looks worse for me to admit that I need some, some help here. or Just don't know what I'm doing. Oh, and it's oh. like, but, and I was like, no, you can't just say you don't know anything. Well, I and call it's going it to happen later, but it's going to be with, what's that? I call it human winner syndrome. Mm. Uh, so uh, the it's a girl. That's type the other shirt are that I with, sell. Yeah. Human giver <laughs> syndrome is the it's a girl script. Um, and of course, when people are trans or non-binary or agender, they have a much more complex relationship and sure. are like maybe even slightly ahead of the game because they have already begun to recognize that who they are does not map onto the script they were given and they are rejecting it, which is what cisgender people also need to do. Except that what we tend to do instead is we're like, actually, this it's a girl script seems to make a lot of sense for me. I feel for my me for example i feel like a woman and so like i'm just i'm just supposed to be that thing and so i'm gonna act like that thing and hide the parts of me that are not pretty happy calm generous and attentive to the needs of others uh so that people don't reject me so like i when i was a little girl was told that i was ugly when i was angry right and little boys are taught all the time big boys don't cry right We get punished for these things. So when you get to be an adult, you believe it's true that you look worse saying, I'm going to need a little help with this. than you do needing a little help and not admitting it. It it is interesting because I do, you know, I understand someone here is, you know, when you said the third one is controversial, you know, I don't think it is when it's explained in terms of like, Like when it's like destroy the gender, you know, what's going on in our minds gender wise. I understand people go that's controversial, but it isn't to say, well, I I keep going back to this guy's example because it's just Mm -hmm. something that happened recently. Yeah, it seems so classic. And and yeah, and it's classic. Exactly. So it's like you go to that example, you go, dude, you're he's going to fail again because he's like fake it till I make it. He's going to get mad about failing and blame other people. As opposed to the better route out of this is, again, non-gender, like is a non-gender norm of going, hey, I'm not good at this. Can you hold my hand through this? And Mm -hmm. that's not even, that isn't even like, that's kind of sexy in its own way for that guy, maybe. You know, he doesn't even know. Yeah. 
if he needs a fake so i'm inclined to like what i want is for people to totally deconstruct the gender binary in their own brains because when you clear out all that stuff you create space for ecstasy and sure. i know that a lot of people are like a pretty long distance away from like blowing up the binary in their brain right. so like if i were going to give advice that like helped him to stick a little bit with the script it would be recognizing that his partner is different from any other partner he has ever had and any other partner he may ever have and it's super sexy to be like i know that you are unique and what you like and want is going to be utterly unique so it doesn't matter what i know from any of my other experiences i want to hear from you about what you like show me what you like tell me what you like put my hand the place you like it mm. so that it's about like i am so focused on you and making sure you experience pleasure and that I'm not just like applying some blanket rules. Right. And when guys, when people do that, that it usually backfires because then they're like, why would he do this crazy move? <laughs> it's clearly someone else told God, him that. Yes. That was someone, someone told him that this was working. <laughs> but like, yeah. Right. And you know what? Uh, you meet one set of genitals. You've met one set of genitals. Mm, even right. if the I, next person has the same set of genitals they're gonna want and like different stuff right i i it's funny that that would speak to that to this you know i'm, I'm now we're, you know hypothetical man i think that speaks to him in a different way than as sad as that is you got to spoon feed some people yeah you no know, yeah like, people this these transitions are really difficult they're moral obligations we are literally punished when we violate the rules that we've been taught. It's only when we get to adulthood and are having these private kinds of connections where we can dare to begin to escape the rules that we were taught and choose instead an authentic and vulnerable kind of erotic intimacy. I've been thinking about like the emails, we get thousands of emails. The ones about sex, like I said, are usually about like, um, I forgot the term you use, dis disparate. Differential desire. Differential desire. Um, but I think a lot of them are also about insecurity, like holding people back from feeling sexual or, or going yeah. into situations where they just they don't feel good about themselves. So they don't get feel good about sex. Do you have like any tips for those people? <laughs> so the short answer is uh, therapy. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because, it's always the answer. Like, right? yeah. I mean, there's yeah. a couple of sources of the kind of insecurity that stops people. One is that they truly don't feel good about themselves. Um, they feel like their body doesn't conform well enough to the culturally constructed beauty ideal. And we all know if people aren't beautiful enough, they don't deserve pleasure, she said, extremely sarcastically, right? We all got that I was, yes. yeah. we're taught the rule that you have to be pretty enough. You have to be attractive enough to deserve pleasure. And that's not true. So embracing a new kind of relationship with your body is important for a lot of people there's a couple of steps you can take with that um one that i recommend in both come as you are and in burnout and in the come as you are workbook because it's so important is the mirror exercise where you stand in front of a full-length mirror as close to naked as you can tolerate you look at what you see there and you write down everything you see that you like and on the first day, it might literally just be your eyelashes or your ankle bones or your spirit because you can see that in your eyes. But if you do it again the next day and again the next day and again the next day, you gradually purge all the cultural noise about your body and begin to be able to recognize your body for the freaking freaking miracle that it is. I Rec love that. See your body with clear eyes. Emily, it's going to be weird when people walk into my apartment and see the word <laughs> penis on all these different lists on the wall. <laughs> but that's so great. So the podcast that, that you mentioned, episode three is about genitals, specifically okay. about curvy penises. Oh, uh, okay. it's for a partner who's like, I'm fine with it. But he feels really uncomfortable and awkward about the fact that his penis is really curvy. So there's a bunch of people, if they have penises, who would not write that down in their list of things they like. It right. would take time and practice right. for them to be like, actually, this is beautiful and wonderful and perfect exactly as it is. I'll throw in balls on that list once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Not every day. Not every day is a good ball day. 
it's the oldest cliche, but like confidence in your own body, no matter what your body right. looks like, is the hottest thing, I think, to any partner. Because you could have So someone let's talk who's... about why confidence is so important. So like my right. thing, my whole reason for existing on earth is that I teach people to live with confidence and joy in their bodies. Uh, and one year when I was teaching college level, a uh, student raised her hand and was like, Emily, can you please define your terms? What is it you exactly mean by confidence and joy? And I was like, that's a good question. Let me get back to you. So I thought about it for a week. And what I finally realized is that confidence is knowing what is true about your body, your sexuality, the culture you live in, what you want and what you like, your experience of desire, your history, knowing what's true, even if it's not what other people tell you is supposed to be true, even if it's not what you wish were true, that's confidence. So that you, if you get into a sexual scenario with another person and you're like, this is what you get. This is me. Uh, it's so much easier for them to receive you right. with the same level of acceptance and confidence. And if you're like, so I apologize that this is all I have to offer. But if you could possibly like lower yourself to accept this, like that is much more difficult for a partner to accept as warmly. And then joy is the hard part. Joy is loving what's true about your body and your sexuality and your experience of desire and your brain and your history and the culture you live in, even if it's not what people tell you should be true. And even if it's not what you wish were true, loving what's true, even when it's not what you wish were true. And, that's and the hard when part. you, yeah, that's the hard <laughs> part. <laughs> that's the thing that like, you're gonna have to keep adjusting all the time because everything's gonna change. I find about every five years I need to relearn to love my body because like it totally changes over. So I like I practice, I work really hard. I do the mirror exercise. I do like social media literacy where I get rid of the stuff that makes me feel bad and I feel great. And then five years later, it's all different. <laughs> Hello, menopause. <laughs> and I have to start over learning to love my body again. So one of those strategies is the mirror exercise because that's where confidence and joy begin. Another source of that like insecurity is like the actual stuff we were taught about sex. Oh, I mean, I started my training as a sex educator when I was 18 years old, and it was immediately obvious that everything I had ever been taught about sex from any source, whether it's my like moderately okay sex education in high school to the romance novels that I read to Glamour magazine, uh, I graduated from high school from 1995, which was before I understood that internet porn was. So people who were younger than me Part of their education was watching porn on the internets, right? And literally nothing that you learn about sex from those sources is good, accurate sex education. So we have to know that we're starting from scratch. We were lied to about literally everything. And we've, again, we're judging ourselves against this like fictional standard that we were lied to about. And because we fall short of that fictional standard, we believe there's something wrong with us. Right. Instead of right. acknowledging that, like, this does not exist, this is not real, and who I actually am is someone worth being. And, you know, I feel like you're, we're talking about this in the context of being sexually confident, but I really feel like you could bring that to not just your body, but really all other aspects of your life to, you know, that Shh, form I'm, of... I'm a sex educator. I'm not actually just helping people <laughs> with their lives. <laughs> Uh, it only works for sex. Don't try right. it. On, <laughs> don't try it on any aspect of your personality. Right. On any other aspect. Yeah, no, you can't make your life better just by like working toward improving your sex life. That's not a thing. That's absolutely a thing. And that's going to happen. Yes. And do you ever hear people who are just like, I'm just not that sexual of a person? Yeah. Is that, do you think that that is possible? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, hello, all asexual community. About 1% mm. of people in North America are asexual. This is sexual orientation where uh, when you're gay, you're attracted to people of kind of the same gender. And when you're straight, you're attracted to people of kind of a different gender. And when you're asexual, you're attracted to nobody, regardless of gender or anything else. There are sex favorable ace folks uh, for whom... So as opposed to sex averse ace folks who are like, nope, no sex for me ever. Sex favorable 
asexual folks. There's an ace sex educator named Aubrey Lancaster who describes sex as like Disneyland. Like maybe your partner just freaking loves Disneyland and they want to go all the time. And like, that's cool. But like, you'll go very occasionally and you'll really love how happy it makes them. And you know, it's fine. Maybe you enjoy Big Thunder Mountain. It's cool. <laughs> Do you? And then like when you've had that one Disney trip, you're like, and I need to not go back to Disney for quite a while now. <laughs> like that's, that's just real. And the ACE community is incredibly diverse and are really good at having conversations that accept the ways that people really vary from each other. Right. It's so interesting. Because you really, again, like, I feel like the, like you said, the sex education is so limiting in terms of, like, what you, what you hear is normal or what you feel like you should be doing or what you feel Literally, like we don't even normal. see illustrations yeah. of curvy penises. This really basic thing we should all know is just a part of life. My people are not represented. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so. For real, though. Now, let's do... Um, Let's do the email. You ready? Let's do the email. I'm ready. Go check out Emily's uh, book, Come As You Are, The Surprising New Science That Will Transform Your Sex Life. And then it's the Come As You Are podcast and the Feminist Survival podcast. Two podcasts. So add it to your Rolodex. Add it to your queue. Get involved with Emily. Uh, we're so happy you came on. Let's. Uh, do you want me to read it or do you want to read it, Jordana? Uh, you can read it. If you want. All right. Ready? Ready. How do I talk to my boyfriend about not being able to orgasm? J and J, love you all so much. I started listening this year. I started with the first episode. And I'm already up to this year's episodes in June. Well, they're almost here. <laughs> they're going to have to wait to <laughs> orgasm a few more months. Uh, okay, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, writing, I'm writing this email because I'm going to my boyfriend's apartment. And I'm going to have a tough conversation. So I just need to put some thoughts down. I feel like what we're about to talk about could be beneficial for some other couples or any other woman who might have a similar issue to me. I'll get right into it. I can't have an orgasm. I've never been able to do with a partner. I have a very hard time having an orgasm with a vibrator. Like I have to be on my back listening to music. I can't be touched and it just generally takes a long time. I'm on antidepressants and have been since I started uh, having sex so I don't know what I'm missing. My current partner has never made me feel bad about it, but I had a partner in the past who told me before we broke up that he was excited to have sex with someone who could actually have an orgasm and not make him feel like a piece of shit. Hey. Uh, so I often worry that how my boyfriend feels, even though he's given me no indication that he feels that way. But also, I don't want a boyfriend who doesn't care if I have an orgasm because then it feels like he's not giving a shit about my pleasure. So that's a contributing factor to why I don't think I ask for things and... Why I don't think I ask for things and sex. What's the point of going down on me if I'm still not going to come? What's the point of foreplay if I'm not going to come? Throughout our relationship, we've kind of realized that I need a little bit more romance before I can get in the mood to even want to have sex. But even if I don't come, it's still important to have those things done for not only my mental state, but also my physical state. I'm realizing that I'm not just always dry, but I could be dry because we're not doing enough foreplay or he's not eating me out. But I still feel bad asking for those things if I can't come. And I still have this internal message in my head that guys don't like to go down on women, even though I know that's not true. Jordana, have you dealt with any hangups when it comes to sex or asking what you want? How do you bring up the things with Mike? Do you blurt it out or do you say something like, hey, I think we need to have a serious conversation later? Jared, have you ever had sex with someone who can't have an orgasm? How do you how did that make you feel? Did it make you feel like a shitty partner? I'm going I'm going to my boyfriend's apartment now, so I won't get answers before we have this conversation. But I know I can't just be me who's afraid to ask and want these things in the bedroom. Thank you uh, for any and all advice. You all are great. I hope to see you in Texas sometime soon. Best can't come and can't think of a good <laughs> sign off. So it's a good sign off. It's a good sign off. She it's got a great it. email. Yeah. I think it's super relatable <sighs> on all ends of the yeah. sexual world. What Emily, what do you think? 
I have so many thoughts and feelings, and I have been asked this question many, many times. Like every aspect of this question right. is something I've heard about multiple times. So that got, that hearing uh, that must make this person feel even more comfortable. I think like there's power so. in hearing that. You, they might feel alone. It's nice to know like this is a problem. Yeah, she identifies as a woman. Do we know how old she is? I don't um, think she gave that info. Because I do want to given... say that 12% of women under the age of 28 have not yet had an orgasm to their knowledge. It okay. is not a small proportion of women 12%. who yeah, who don't okay. begin to have orgasms until they're well into adulthood. Um, the oldest age at which anyone has personally told me they had their first orgasm is the age of 75. Oh, wow. So, like, the that must have been quite me, an explosion. That, can you imagine? 70. I wasn't like, there. I, I, good for them. Like, I, I just well, think it's like, a, I'm just imagining that moment. Like, you, it's like, like um, that movie. Have you seen that movie out with, um, what is her name? Cheers to you, something. Emma Thompson, I remember good luck the, Leo yes, Grand. Yes. Good luck to you, is Leo that Grand. What? Yes, that was it. Yeah. Good luck to she you, has Leo her Grand. first orgasm in her 50s. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I just, shit, spoiled the ending. Sorry about Sorry. that. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> I was really pleased with that. So step one for me is can we replace the word can't have an orgasm with don't have an orgasm? Okay. I like that. Uh, because she's uh, what I would describe as pre-orgasmic, which is to say she has not yet had an orgasm, but she absolutely, no, she does have orgasms. She says that she has them from she uh, has vibrators them. when she she's by herself to to. listening yeah. to music. She thinks she feels like it takes, quote, a long time. We don't know how long that is. Right. It's normal for orgasm to take, you know, up to an hour or an hour and a half. That's some people. It's a combination of like activation of the accelerator and disactivation, turning off the brakes so she probably has a bunch of stuff in her life for example feeling really judgmental toward herself about the ways she doesn't have orgasm according to the way she was taught she was supposed to have orgasm like does feeling like you don't do orgasms right does that activate the accelerator no, no the brakes <sighs> absolutely hits yes. the brake so even as she's masturbating a part of her brain is like it shouldn't be taking me this long why am I broken? Like, I right. really wish I could be different. And all of that stuff is just keeping the brakes on and making orgasm less and less accessible to her. Mm. So from don't have an orgasm rather than can't have an orgasm, does have orgasms, has orgasms. Yes. And an orgasm is an orgasm is an orgasm. The only measure of it is whether or not you liked it. And if she likes the orgasm she has, she's doing it right. And she's right. fine. Another thing that's really important for me to say out loud is what's the point of her partner going down on her when she's not going to have an orgasm? The point is pleasure. Pleasure right. and orgasm are not the same thing. Not all orgasms are pleasurable. And a lot of things that aren't orgasm are really pleasurable. Right. Just because you don't get to what you consider the end point or like the constructed destination, like uh, I suppose there are people who would be like, what's the point on um, my partner going down on me if they're not going to keep going down on me until I have an orgasm, I guess. But like, what's the point is that it feels really good. Yeah. What's the point Life of playing a, a pickup game of basketball if you're not going to win the NBA championship? It's it, I, I'm with you. Right. It's because uh, it's fun. It's, it's a fun. game you're playing yeah. together. You are enjoying it. Yes. And I think you highlight something very like important in that like she's telling herself a story that is now making it come true. And I think people do that. All the time with all sorts of things in their life where you tell yourself. No, like, only in the sexual domain. That's the only <laughs> time that happens. <laughs> right. Well, you're telling yourself this like kind of sad story, but it's only true because you're saying it's true. And, you know, your thoughts are not necessary. You don't have to believe every thought that you have. So your thought telling you that you, you don't orgasm or you can't come or you're not sexual. Like that's not necessarily true. That's the story that you t decided to tell yourself that now right. feeds the rest of the actions that come out of that story yeah so in terms of talking to a partner about it step one confidence know what is true about you i have orgasms they happen in a really specific context so far uh and they take 
an amount of time that doesn't like if I ask how long our orgasms are supposed to take, people have an idea in their head of what that time is. And the thing is, that is a fiction. But when you have that standard in your mind, it and you're not meeting that standard. There's actually a mechanism in your brain. It's called the discrepancy reducing feedback loop, which makes you increasingly frustrated if you're not reaching it. And heck, if your partner has an idea of how long your orgasm is supposed to take and they start getting frustrated with you, like it's just going to make it worse. Uh, so how to talk about it is to be confident, to like know what is true, attempt to love what is true, even though it's not what you wish were true. And don't have this conversation for the first time during sex for sure <laughs> like set up a pleasurable delightful like a dinner time conversation we're like let's talk about how to make our sex even better than it is because you're great and i'm great and we're great and let's make it even greater here's the thing uh if you're a person who uh doesn't have orgasm with a partner that's called secondary anorgasmia. It means you have orgasms in some circumstances and not in other circumstances. If you have orgasms in one circumstance, very likely you can have orgasms from a different circumstance. One thing to let go of, since we've got, I think, a cisgender, definitely heterosexual couple, is uh, only about a f less than a third of women are reliably orgasmic from penetration alone. In the research, they call it unassisted intercourse. Uh, the remaining more than two thirds to three quarters are sometimes rarely or never orgasmic from penetration alone. So erase any idea that orgasm is going to be happening first and foremost with penetration. It's statistically not likely for a person who's not having orgasms with their partner yet. Um, and there are all kinds of books about I've actually been, if people have great recommendations for more recent books, I would love to hear them because all the books specifically about orgasm come like from the 80s and 90s and they're all written by white middle-aged cisgender women and it's just really a limited, but they're good books as far as they go. Uh, one of them is Becoming Orgasmic, which is for pre-orgasmic and secondary orgasmic women. Um, there's For Yourself by Lonnie Barbuck. Oh, uh... Becoming Orgasmic is by Julia, you're going to laugh, Hyman and Joseph <laughs> Lepiccolo. For Yourself by Lonnie Barbach. Uh, there's the late, great Betty Dodson, Sex for One. There's so many ways, so many books that can potentially teach people more about orgasm. Of course, I recommend Come As You Are, which has a whole chapter about orgasm. And uh, like all the other stuff helps, too. Uh, right. So... Uh, one of the important things, because especially if well, if your partner's a cis dude got raised with the It's a Boy script, um, anything that even blows a light wind in the direction of criticism can potentially just like shut everything down. So I highly recommend framing the conversation in terms of what a superhero he is how compliment amazing sa compliment sandwich so many things are absolutely compliment sandwich oh but when you get those blowjobs from me like a slice of banana <laughs> when you go don't go down on me it's the best that everyone has ever not gone down on me <laughs> right but like I, if your partner is like you fucking have to go down on me there's something wrong with you if you don't go right. down on me like are you gonna go down on that person well, yeah. it is interesting. I, mean, I, I, it, it kind of the, the conversation we had before about the gender norms and you know breaking that, you know the gender um, th that we know the gender structures that we know. It is interesting that you're telling this woman that she's got to come in a little angry, horny, and looking to win. Like she's got to come in being like, well, like I'm not getting. You, you, I, no, 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 I, no, 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 okay. no, no, no. She needs to come in being like, you are so amazing. Handsome. And right. I love our sexual connection so much that I want to share something with you that feels a little scary to me. Okay. And I'm trusting you to be able to like be okay receiving this, like this thing that I have been taught by a culture that lied to me means that there's something wrong with me. And I believe that you're such an amazing human being that you're not going to feel that way. You're not going to feel like there's anything wrong with you and there's nothing wrong with me. It is probably going to be necessary to address the strength tester game 
of the situation where the it's a boy type people are raised to believe you know when you go to the county fair they have the strength tester you get a big hammer and you hit the thing and if something goes up and dings the bell and if it dings the bell you're a man right (laughs) for a lot of people their partner's orgasm is like that so if he feels that way about her orgasm then her lack of orgasm is going to feel to him like he's not enough. When that goes, if it hasn't that, happened with any other parent partner, like it's it's not him. Right. They just haven't yet found the right context for her to be orgasmic with a partner. It is totally normal. It is very common, especially in younger people, to be orgasmic by yourself and not with another person. Because especially when you're an it's a girl type person, uh, as soon as you get with another person, you start really monitoring their expectations and needs and like how is the thing and how are the hanging and the cottage cheese on the back of my thighs all of that monitoring and all the worry about your partner is just hitting the brakes it shuts everything down and it takes time to develop trust and familiarity to know that your partner is not judging you and does accept and love and welcome all the parts of your body. Only 11% of college age women report having an orgasm the first time they have sex with a new partner. I would say that's definitely true. Right. (laughs) I always, anytime I have sex with a woman that doesn't orgasm, I say, this is totally normal. Yes. (laughs) So I wasn't sure where you were going there. No. Like the thing about, the thing about, uh, but I don't want to be with someone who doesn't think it matters that I don't have orgasms. Yes. Right. I, I want her not to be in a relationship with someone who doesn't believe her pleasure is at least as important as his. But right. But her pleasure being important is not the same as her orgasm being important because that just gets you on like the sexual Olympics game of feeling competitive right. and frustrated. When you have a goal like that, it's possible to fail. Right. And the possibility of failure will only shut things down. Right. When your I, goal is pleasure, you are always already winning. That's such a great way to put it. So I, I, I actually had an idea for them. I want to hear if you think it's stupid, Emily. Okay. You can okay, say I'm, it. I tell him sometimes that the ideas I, are stupid. So. Oh, yeah, I will. Right. Please do. And <laughs> I, I, I just was hearing this question. And I was like, and I agree with, I think this conversation, everything you said about the conversation is such like a winning conversation. Now, what if they have the conversation and it goes so well, okay? And he's like, I'm here for it. Pleasure Town, USA. What if they, that? what if then she says to her partner, I would like you to create a pleasure fun house. And I want... <laughs> Every corner of this apartment or house, rooms, different rooms of the house or different corner of the apartment will be about pleasure regions for me. There's going to be vibrator alley. There's going to be lube station. There's going to be the food court. Like, we'll get all these different sections. Like, Like, what if they did that as a night and then it becomes... I don't care how long we're in here, however long it takes us to get to all the fun house rooms it takes us, and I will get to treat you. You can treat me in the way I've been treating you all this time because I got a lot of backlog of not getting gone down on. Wouldn't that be fun? I think Jared is is too creative for his own good sometimes. (laughs) I didn't necessarily hear that she wasn't getting gone down on. I heard that she was not asking for what she wanted. Okay, so... so Maybe he wanted to. Maybe uh, she just, it, the reason it wasn't happening is because she, but actually, so you remember Peggy Klein plots? Yeah. How could I forget that name? Yeah. The first <laughs> homework assignment in her group couples sex therapy, and her homework is never sexually explicit. Hmm. Her first homework assignment is for the couple to go home and look at their bedroom and make it so that it's a place where it's really easy to experience pleasure. To mm. make it a pleasure fun house. There we go. I'm I'm Peggy Klein. That's an house. evidence-based idea. It's there not we just go. not mock worthy. It is that's some science, baby. I am not mocking at all. This is a this is an idea that I think would be employable, but I wouldn't wanted to hear from an expert. So that Yeah. The only thing is, no pressure. You end nope. as soon as anybody's like, that was great. <laughs> right. No pressure. I've just invested three thousand dollars in this. <laughs> <laughs> 
in this pleasure fun house. Like, I'm all set. Like, yeah, that was the, that was wonderful, and I'm done now. Someone turn off the music, and then all of a sudden, da 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 how some people really feel like if someone doesn't eat every bite of food on their plate, then it's like an insult to the meal. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm in Boca right now with my Jewish mom. Yeah, I know that person. Yeah. So that's not what we're looking for in a sexual situation. Right. That's a like, good that's a good warning. Right. Eat as much as feels pleasurable and delightful for you. And your pleasure is what matters to me, not your performance that suggests to me that I have succeeded. Well, you just answered my other question, which was going to be like, what are tips from the person on the other end of, you know, receiving this information from the person who's, you know, either I can't orgasm or a lot of sometimes it's men. I, I'm coming too quickly or I take too long to come um, mm-hmm. in their own head or something. So I, I, I do wonder, I think that's that's great advice for the person receiving sexual feedback because it can be hard to take sexual feedback and not take it personally for a man or a woman or any gender oh yeah because it's like it makes you a failure right so i guess to be like what are your tips for just being open-minded about that i I liked what you said about not it not being about the outcome like making it for them making it about their pleasure so john green uh just published a book called the anthropocene reviewed where he talks about a poem by, uh, an essay by a poet named Donald Hall, who wrote about his multi-decade marriage to another poet, Jane Kenyon. Um, They lived in a rural Vermont home and people will come visit from New York and be like, it's really beautiful here, but like, what do you do here? Uh, Cause what do you do in rural Vermont? And the essay says, what did we do? We did not spend our time gazing into each other's eyes. We were focused on third things. Third things are essential in relationships. They are points of joint rapture and contentment. And it can be like a particular artist's work. It can be your favorite music. It can be your kids. It can be your backyard garden. It can be the poetry that you write together. And I think that the co-creation of erotic pleasure absolutely can be a third thing it's a hobby it's a project that you share together with a sense of curiosity joint rapture and contentment like what a gift it is to have a partner in creating moments of pleasure in your life when you stop thinking about it as like i have to fix this or else i'm broken or i have to fix my partner or else there's a problem it's the two of us are accepting who we each are and we are taking what's true about our lives right now and finding the ways that we can activate big pleasure in our lives together. There's no such thing as failure. It's just this shared third thing that you collaborate on as partners because it's fun. I love that. I like that. I like that a lot. That's great. Listen, Jordan, I think uh, this is such a great episode. Emily, we're so happy you came on. This was fantastic. It was fun for me. It's my favorite thing to talk about. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Of Thank course. You. I feel like I learned so much. I'm sure the I listeners too. have too. And if you want more from Emily, check out, again, her book, Come As You Are, The Surprising New Science That Will Transform Your Sex Life, and her newer book, Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle, and her two podcasts, Come As You Are and The Feminist Survival Podcast. Um, so check those out. Where can they find you on, like, on anywhere else they can find you that we haven't mentioned? Uh, I'm occasionally on Instagram, Enagoski. Uh, and I have a newsletter. If you go to emilynagoski.com, you can sign up for the Substack newsletter, which is very occasional, is mostly answering people's sex questions. Love it. Perfect. And if you like this episode, you'll obviously like more answering of sex questions by an actual expert. Um, that's great. Well, that's also, for- fuck that other partner who said, <laughs> I want to be with somebody who has orgasms. Yeah, right. That was, that's that was fucked up. It's fucked up. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And Fuck them. That's our. And on that note, <laughs> we will see you next week on the UA podcast. That's it for today. Bye. The UA podcast is produced by Sean Kilby, Maddie Paul, and Jorge Morales Pico. Editing by Jorge Morales Pico. Social media by Maddie Paul. Be sure to follow at u.up.podcast on Instagram and send us your emails to uup at betches.com. <laughs>